Thank you, Nick, very much for those words, and <clears throat> thank you to Hatch Artists, Cornucopia and Treasure Trove, that we all adore. Uh, Richard's organised everything very well. It's lovely to have friends, acquaintances, and ships that pass in the night here um, for this moment. Uh, these things are always a, a little curious, because you, you wonder what you should explain about the book. Uh, not too much, because... Believe it or not, it has a plot. <laughs> <laughs> if I spoil it, then you won't turn the page, which is really not the idea. But I'm struck by a couple of conversations I've had, although I feared I would have them. Uh, in fact, I knew I would have them. But I do need to say that no one who knows anything about the events that lie behind this story, although they have nothing to do with it because it's a story, have the faintest idea what it's about. And I made a decision, it was quite a tricky decision actually. Um, I thought, well, I'm going to write a novel based in, in 1985. A couple of big things going on. There was the sort of um, beginning of the end of the Gordievsky story in Moscow, and there was um, the run up to the Anglo Irish Agreement, which was signed in November of that year. And of course, it would have been possible to ring up some people who knew quite a bit about it, at least in the latter case, possibly not in the former, for reasons you'll understand. Um, and I made a, quite a conscious decision that the worst thing I could do would be to talk to anyone who knew anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't. And so they're clean, and in a sense, so am I, because it's a work of fiction. The only thing I think that is <clears throat> authentic is the sort of mise-en-scene of Washington in the mid-80s, which I think is right. You know, Nathan's on the corner of M in Wisconsin, and Mr. Smith's piano bar. I was once ejected from piano school <laughs> <laughs> in 1981 for the reasons we needn't go into <laughs> while the pianist was on his break. So I think those things are fairly, I hope, accurate. The rest of it is entirely made up. <laughs> and I should say, since the... Um, a former ambassador to Washington here and others who've laboured in that vineyard in various ways, <coughs> that as he and any of you who know the place, and there are many here who do, will realise very quickly the geography of it or the internal uh, management of it has been completely thrown upside down. So has the, the working habit of the ambassador, his love life, all these things. They are completely completely imaginary. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that genuinely. <laughs> Actually, I do. Um, but I thank the people that I've known who've helped with this, as it were, unwittingly over the years. But it's a story. The thanks are obvious. Uh, to Nick and everybody at Head of Zeus, um, Peyton and Polly and uh, their teams who've helped with all the preparation for the book. And at the same time, obviously, my family, uh, our three children um, are here, uh, with their loved ones, and particularly the dedicatee of this book, uh, Vidi, who is going to be fi 15 weeks old on Thursday, <laughs> and has behaved perfectly. I expect her to be reading by Easter. <laughs> <laughs> Above all, in a family context, all of you, and most of you do, who know us will know how deep my gratitude is to Ellie. Uh, <laughs> how it increases with time, and I couldn't do it um, without the kind of support, and if I may say, a certain editorial rigor. With which many of you are familiar down the years. And talking of editorial rigor, of course, talking of head of use, we talk about Rosie, by uh, Ducosi, my editor, who is, you know, the queen of editors. And to have an editor who says to you, well, Dayton, I think, wouldn't have done that. <laughs> it's a bit rough, chilly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Winston <laughs> Graham would have found a way around that. But anyway, Rosie and I have such fun. She's just great. She's a wonderful editor and an inspiration. And she keeps you to the straight and narrow. People often say, how do you... How do you write a book like this? Well, the answer is, you, I don't really know, except the LNER train, <laughs> which takes four and a quarter hours from Edinburgh, 
It's a very good place. Ellie and I have often talked about getting a kind of roving ticket where I just basically stay. <laughs> <laughs> and never get off. It's tucked away. And people do in the end notice there's an acronym now uh, called a Willy, W I L L I E. Uh, work in London, live in Edinburgh. <laughs> and all I will say is that a lot of willies waving at each other. <laughs> 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 anyway, trying to, I have to say, play a slight part. Fleming, the, um, the central character around whom the plot turns, um, you know, a, a very complicated but wonderful man, I think. Um, he enjoys particularly the sleeper, which I do, and I sort of grew up coming down in the sleeper from the far north. And... Um, I've had conversations, very weird conversations about the sleeper over the years. I remember having a conversation particularly with Sir Nicholas Soames, no less, about the sleeper, an age ago. And needless to say, Nick shoot the sleeper in order to shoot harmless, hearty beasts wandering around glens in Sutherland. But anyway, he enjoyed the sleeper. And I said, well, the sleeper's a great thing. And he said, oh, indeed, I have reason to be very grateful to the sleeper. And I said, well, why? And he said, I was conceived. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, a, I mean, quite a difficult thing to respond to. <laughs> so I said, it's the only thing you can say. I said, well, where? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, oh, I can tell you exactly. He said, at, at Crew Junction, where it goes bump, bump, bump over the point. A bit of Churchilliana that some of you probably don't know. <laughs> so I'm grateful to LNER as well. <laughs> and I would simply say that um, the joy of writing for Rosie and everybody at Head of Juice is, is wonderful. Um, I would simply say to you that um, it's quite fun when you're in my trade, your trade, so many of uh, our friends who are here are in the trade in one way or another, when you're obliged not to make it up. You know, there's a basic idea that we try to tell the truth, or in the old phrase, it was true when I wrote it, or it was true when I broadcast it. The joy of being able not to worry about that, and making it up, possibly to the fury of some people who are here, but for fun, for enjoyment, to ask somebody to turn the page is something that I find kind of helps keep me going. So I hope you enjoy it. I thank everybody who's helped, particularly in the family and at Head of Zeus, and see me through this. And um, I just hope you have a good time reading it. It seems to me that if there is a toast to be made, which I suppose there should be, um, being an old fashioned, a bit planning as an old fashioned traditionalist at heart, and I, I think in a curious way, so am I. So there does need to be a kind of a toast at the end. And I think, since I enjoy not only trying to tell something approximating to the truth, or at least the truth as it stands at the moment on the BBC, it's also great to just make it up and let it rip. <laughs> and therefore, the toast has to be. Fiction. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all very much.